Hi, this is uh, Dr. Ken Kelly. I am a colleague of Dr. Rashida Crutchfield. And uh, I just wanted to do a little bit of brief introduction of her. She's an associate professor at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, I serve as the director of the basic needs program at Cal State Long Beach. And Dr. Crutchfield was at, started at the beginning of our uh, program for basic needs back in 2015. She received her doctorate from Cal State Long Beach in uh, 2012. She received her master's from Washington University, George Warren Brown School of Social Work in 2003, and her bachelor's degree is also from Cal State Long Beach. She's won numerous awards, including the CSU Chancellor's Office Faculty Involvement and Leadership Award in 2018, as well as the California State Student Association Faculty of the Year Award. Um, she also has been uh, integral in our research into the California State University system-wide uh, look at food and uh, housing insecurity for our for students. Uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rashida Crutchfield. Thank you, Ken, so much. Hello, everyone. I'm sharing my camera for the moment, but will go away so that you don't find yourself staring at me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, honored to be asked. Uh, thank, I wanna thank also Tiki and Janelle for your uh, assistance in this process and everyone else at NASPA for having me here. And also all of you who are here watching uh, this webinar. Um, I know that we're all in very different places um, and the, <laughs> The world around us feels constantly shifting, and in some ways, it's it's um, for some of us this can be you know a, a comfortable time, and for others of us, we have very different levels of access to comfort and health and well-being. And so I'm really honored that all of you have taken some time uh, to be here with me electronically to explore basic needs for our students. Um, and I encourage you to stand up and walk around and stretch as often as possible. Because if I don't, if you're anything like me, sitting in a chair doing Zoom meetings quite often has created some interesting back pain. So I do encourage you to be comfortable in the world that you're in. Um, here in California, it's Cesar Chavez Day, so I wanted to. Um, recognize that and recognize Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez for their work and commitment to farm workers. And I think it's also very timely to recognize, given the topic today, that we right now have farm workers who are still working to help maintain our pipeline. And so I really honor the sacrifices that they're making for all of us. Um, I'm going to frame this conversation about basic needs today in two different ways. I'm going to talk about how it's been, what has been happening for our students who experience basic needs insecurity, and I am going to talk a bit about the landscape for us now, uh, given the closures and the um, continued and escalated scarcity and traumas that our students are facing given the COVID-19 um, crisis that we're dealing with right now. So I am going to talk a bit about both and it, it probably will feel a little bit um, disjointed at times because it is the time before and the time now and we will vision the time after because we know that there will be a time after. Um, so from you all, I want to ask two questions. And the first, and you can um, add your response, I believe, and Tiki, tell me if I'm wrong, but you can add in the question box, we'll start with who's in the room. So what um, roles do you play in your institution? And perhaps even what, uh, what state you're in. So I'll give a moment for folks to type in what kinds of roles are represented here in our meeting and where you are. Uh, diversity of Director of Diversity Programs, uh, Virginia, Associate Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Wisconsin, Director of 
residence life or student life in Washington State, director of uh, Dean of Students in Colorado. We've got program coordinators. It's coming in so fast. I'm just going to let it load for just a second. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you all for participating so wonderfully. Uh, Rashida, there's over 100 now. How many would you like me to read? Yeah. Maybe just generally speaking. Sure, we've got everything from assistant directors working in diversity and inclusion work to coordinator levels for um, uh, residents' lives. We've even got some master students in here, uh, folks who are also in orientation. And we've got folks from all over the country. Cool thing is after this, Rashida, I'll be able to share with you where everybody uh, typed in that they were coming from. That's amazing. Thank you, Tiki, and thank you Absolutely. all. And I... Oh, uh, oh, oh, sorry. And we have a wonderful... We've got a great number of academic advisors as well. Fantastic. So, all righty. Great, because I know that what happens sometimes when we're talking about basic needs is that um, when we're talking about these uh, food and housing insecurities, that sometimes we um, shift that over to one person in one spot. And we'll talk a little bit about a single point of contact uh, strategy, but it really is, it really does take a village to do this really well. And so I'm really glad that there's all sorts of folks who are represented in in the in the meeting i'm wondering if there are burning questions that people have that they would like me to address i will talk about all sorts of things and you will probably end up thinking okay she didn't need to say so many things but i'm wondering if there are burning questions that i should definitely get into and maybe just a few tiki Right now, we don't have any questions, um, but we invite people to continue to enter them into the questions box, and we will forward them to Rashida as they come in. Wonderful. Okay. All right. So my background, I will say, is that I came to academia first um, as a practicing social worker. So I um, was a community-based social worker primarily as an organizer, um, and I worked in schools and I worked with young people and adults and older, older adults um, identifying social problems that folks wanted to address and helping facilitate the process of change. Um, just prior to coming to Cal State Long Beach, I worked at Covenant House California. And Covenant House is a national organization um, addressing youth homelessness. And I was at Covenant House for uh, three years or so. And while I was there, we had a number of residents who were, um, you know, obviously living in the shelter, but they were also going to college. Many of them were going to community colleges, but some of them were going to four-year universities as well. And what we were finding was that some of our residents were experiencing barriers to their progress in college that had less to do with their homeless experience and more to do with the fact that they, that the institutions were not prepared for them. So at the time, this would have been, say, 2006. We had a resident who um, was going to her local community college, and she was going just uh, prior to her semester start. And she went to financial aid, um, and financial aid had, had asked her to come in because she needed to provide the tax information for her parents. And she said, I don't have that information. I'm homeless. I'm not connected to my parents. And that particular financial aid administrator said, well, you don't look homeless. Um, you're probably just having a hard time with your parents and you really should just go talk to them, get their tax forms, but you're going to have to wait until next semester to come back. And so she came back to us completely distraught. She had temporary housing for about six months and if she had had to come back in six months, that probably would have ended her college career. Also, there was no way she was going to get access to her um, financial aid information from her parents. At that time, our financial aid administrators really didn't have guidance um, from the federal government or institutions because none of us were really thinking about students who were experiencing homelessness. 
um, there were folks out there who were working steadfast with students as they found them, but as a as systemically, generally speaking, people were not addressing homelessness for college students. Um, so when I started my doctoral degree, I decided to write my dissertation on homelessness in higher ed. And at the time, there really wasn't literature in that uh, area. So that and that has been my passion ever since. Um, and now there are a small but mighty group of folks who are really looking at this issue um, academically, and many folks. Um, in student affairs who really are driven to address these issues for our students. Um, and so that's where I come from in this work. Often when I start a presentation um, on food insecurity and housing insecurity, I like to say overtly with my colleague uh, Ron Hallett and I, when we present together, we like to say directly, students experiencing homelessness and food insecurity attend colleges and universities across the nation. Um, I feel like we've gotten to the point now, um, as of uh, end of March 2020, where this is less of a surprise um, to many of us, but still, I think it needs to be said. Um, a very long in 2009, I went to a, a conference. It was um, Encore when I was talking about homelessness in universities, and many people were saying to me, "Oh, that's interesting. We don't have that." And I hear that comment less and less now because I think we know that we have that, but I still think it's worth being said. Also, I think just as important is that students experiencing these insecurities aspire, uh, to aspire to attend higher education and complete a certificate or a degree, that they are working hard and want to persevere. Um, my work, as Ken mentioned, um, in the last five years or so has been focused on California, particularly California State University as a system. We are 23 universities in California, um, over 480,000 students. At Long Beach, where I am faculty, we have about 38,000 students. So each of our 23 campuses are like small cities. Um, of students who are all coming from all different kinds of backgrounds with all different kinds of dreams and aspirations. I was commissioned by our chancellor of the CSU system to study student basic needs. So in phase one, uh, we did an initial study of staff, faculty, and administrators' perceptions of basic needs and security and, and gathered some preliminary student data. In phase two, I worked with my research partner, Dr. Jennifer McGuire, who's at Humboldt State University, and we sent a survey to 23, all 23 of our campuses. So we used a census survey uh, to every student who was enrolled at the time. Um, and we did interviews and focus groups at 11 campuses. So yes, I traveled to 11 campuses in Northern, Southern, and Central California and spoke to about 213 students. In phase three, we took that same phase two data and looked at how and if students access services on and off campus, how do they utilize their time and how do they utilize their financial resources? So now I'm gonna to go to poll one and ask you, so Tiki, you can launch that first uh, uh, poll one um, and ask you, have you worked with a student who has experienced food insecurity? Um, and that's for everyone. So you, I'm gonna give you a few moments to jump in. Have you, have you worked with a student who was experiencing food insecurity? And let's see what, 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 what you all say. Please remember to answer in the poll. Thank you for those who've answered in our questions or chat box, but there's a poll currently up on your screen. And we're over 75% voted, so we're going to wait just another minute or so.
Thank you, everyone. So we have, as you can see, 83% of us have already worked with students who are experiencing food insecurity. Um, and this makes a lot of sense. One, because you're here in this particular uh, presentation and therefore are interested, but two, because we know that this is an issue across many of our institutions. So let's go to poll number two. How about this? Have you worked with a student who is experiencing homelessness? So I'll give you a few moments. Poll number two, have you worked with a student who is experiencing homelessness? Interesting. Okay, so now we're at about 69% of us said yes, we absolutely know we've experienced students, or we've worked with students who've experienced homelessness, and no for 10%. And I don't know, which I think is important to point out, and probably would have been important to point out in the last poll as well, because we know that these issues are not visible. So going back to my story about the resident at Covenant House, um, she was told that she didn't quote, look homeless. And it was interesting when I worked at the shelter, sometimes people would come in and ask me, so where are the youth that are homeless? Because you know they, they didn't see anyone that, that uh, mirrored what their stereotype me, might be of what homelessness quote unquote looks like. Um, and we know that our students who experience these basic needs and securities um, are just like um, our typical students. They just are dealing with things that we may, may or may not be aware of. Thank you, Tiki. So let's go to question number three. And that is, has your campus or system, um, so if you're a multi-campus system, you can, you can address it that way, but have you conducted research to explore how many students experience basic needs and securities? So I'm wondering how many of us know the numbers, know perhaps how many or in what ways our students are experiencing these issues? That would be poll number three. when you have an opportunity to be. Whoa, all right. And this makes a lot of sense. So 44% of us said yes, that's very exciting. Um, I think often this is where we start. 19 of us said no, and so there's opportunities there and 37% said not sure or I don't know. And I think this is this is important. I think sometimes it's I look at I look at the data and research in in a couple of different ways. Um, clearly, I'm a researcher. <laughs> this is what I do, and this is what I enjoy. And so, I think it is important to have data to really help support our movement in these processes. Um, often, people. Uh, we we need we want to know what the issues look like for our students on our campus in particular because clearly campus culture and climate differs from place to place. Also, I find though that research or the lack thereof often becomes a sticking point. So people will say we cannot move forward at all until we have research, and I think we have to be careful about. Um, allowing that to be a barrier to, to moving forward. I, I was very fortunate in that, um, and Tiki, you can bring that down if you like. Um, I was very fortunate to be on a campus where we had, at the time of Dean, Dean, a dean of students, Dr. Jeff uh, Claus, who, and um, a number of people, including Rachel Ang, who were seeing students coming in, experiencing these issues, and we both 
launched a program because we knew we had to and alongside the fact that the research was happening. So we did do both because we knew there was a need and just it's sort of like how many do they need to be for us to really feel like we have to start something new. Um, so, you know, the data absolutely helps ground in our work um, and we also have to be willing to try as that happens because research Good research takes time, but our students need our support today. And there's lots of resources there for you to get that research done, and we can talk about that shortly. What I wanna do though is make sure we're all on the same page in some of these terms that I've been using. So I think it's important for us to know that food security, when I'm talking about food security, we get our definitions for what food security is from the USDA. High and marginal food security, generally, just generally speaking, means that I don't have um, barriers or limitations to getting food. Um, so even now, even though I am homebound um, because of the closures due to COVID-19, I know that I am able to access food given that I have the financial resources to get it. I am not food insecure right now, even though I would really love to go outside and sit in a restaurant, but that is not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about when we're talking about food insecurity is low food security and very low food security. So those lower two bars are what we would call food insecure. So low food security means that I have a reduct, I, I might have food, but I have a reduction in quality or variety because I cannot afford to have that food. So when I'm talking, we're not when we're talking about food insecurity, we're not always talking about hunger because I can be food insecure and be full. I can I spoke to one student in interviews who said, I don't have a lot of food, but I eat apples all day. And I know that apples are healthy, and so I eat apples, and I'm never hungry, so I'm okay, right? And um, it wasn't my job as a researcher in that moment to school him, but I gave him some resources and help him understand that if I'm eating rice or apples or whatever because I cannot afford other nutrients, then I am not well. Often I'm not well. So while we see some students who are food insecure who may be underweight, we also see students who are food insecure who may experience obesity or diabetes because of that reduction of quality of food. Very low food security, which is that bottom bar, is interrupted patterns of food. So eating less or not having food or missing meals because I do not have um, the financial resources to have food. But those lower two bars are both food insecure. So in California, what we found, not just in the CSU, but across our public institutions of higher education, 48% um, of, so the UCs, um, sort of at the top of our public California public higher education food chain, so to speak, 48% of undergrads were food insecure, 25% uh, of graduate students. Um, in the CSU and the C in the California Community Colleges, we didn't break it down that way. 40, almost 42% of our 480,000 students experienced food insecurity, and 50% of California Community Colleges experienced food insecurity, just for context. And I will say that though, I know many of you are from all over the country and studies are showing uh, across the country that a lot of these numbers are very consistent. Um, there clearly are differences in, 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 very, in a variety of regions, but generally speaking, we're seeing consistency um, across our institutions. In terms of homelessness, what does that mean? And so really, when we think about what does homelessness mean, um, our, our US Department of Education gives us guidelines. Uh, homelessness in, in both K-12 and higher education is defined by the US Department of Education as a lack of fixed, adequate, and regular place to stay. 
a lack of fixed, adequate, and regular place to stay. So for most of us, it's very clear that we know that if someone is living in a homeless shelter, living in a car or a park or abandoned building, all of that is homelessness. Um, living in a motel or a hotel is homelessness. What we see most often in higher ed is couch surfing or dorm surfing. So students who are moving from place to place because they have no place to stay. So what I like to say um, is that I travel quite a bit, either because of research that I'm conducting or, or supporting in other parts of the country or because I'm speaking or whatever. And so often I wake up not knowing where I am and I'm uncomfortable and it's frustrating. Um, and I know that I have a consistent place to stay. For our students who are bouncing from place to place, they have that discomfort and constant instability and insecurity and that not knowing of what's next. That is homelessness as well. I'm pausing because I'm wondering if there are questions up to this point. Yes, Rashida, we've sent you a bunch in the chat. We're happy to read them if you'd like that. That would be great. Sure, I can read a couple. So a question has come in from uh, your experience with community colleges. So some community colleges don't have residence halls, uh, but they're doing what they can to assist students. Or do you know what they're doing, especially male students? Uh, it seems that there are many resources for female homeless students, but not as many for males. Do you have anything, um, I, or do you know of anything that might help that? Sure, I will talk towards the end about some of the strategies that we're using around um, homelessness at the community college level. Here in the state of California, and I know this is gonna be annoying for folks, because folks think we're just hanging out here with money and liberalism, but it's tough here too. Um, we have, but we do most recently have had an investment in uh, programs for rapid rehousing. So um, this has been a collaboration. And actually, if you're interested, um, Hovenus Inc. is an organization here in uh, California that has a model and Hovenus is youth in Spanish. I won't spell it because I spell badly in English and worse in Spanish, but um, they have a model for a college success program in which the, a local housing agency um, is helping to facilitate students into continuums of care, meaning housing um, agency services that, that are referred by their local community colleges. And for us at Long Beach State, we're working with them as well. So I'll talk a bit more about that towards the end, but I think that has been, that, that uh, partnership with community-based agencies has been incredibly important. Another question has come in about uh, international students' basic needs, especially because they can't travel back to their own home countries or have visa issues. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that as well? and how to help identify their needs and provide for them. Right, we've had some really interesting, I mean, it's there's sort of like before COVID-19 and after COVID-19, because we've had some, some we are, well, for me right now, I'm actually doing some research specifically with international students, because I think um, for many of us, we have seen international students as students, obviously our students often, um, from outside of the United States have required that they have to show that they have a certain amount of financial capacity uh, to be in our institutions. And for many of our students, that meant that lots of family members contributed um, to ensure that they could come here, but that doesn't mean that they have resources. And so um, prior to COVID-19, some of our exploration is really working with our um, university extension services to really prepare for or help students prepare for the actual cost of living here um, and really making sure that students are very, thank you, Janelle, are very aware of, of what economic crisis they might be facing even before they get here. Um, now, a lot of our students, um, our international students have, you know, for those of us who have housing on campus are now staying on campus um, because they could not afford to go or because we just can't travel right now. 
And I think we're all learning together about the best way to support them. And again, I'll talk a bit more about some of the resources that we do have, although it is more difficult for our students, um, for our, fam our, our family of students who um, may not be eligible for some of the local services. I and then the last question that we're going to take for right now, or at some point, uh, folks would love some advice on how to advocate for the expansion of the, the definition of basic needs to go beyond just food and housing, maybe such as child care or transportation or other things like that. So if at some point you might be able to touch upon that as you move forward. Yeah, and I will say that I'm, I focus in on food and housing as the very basic of basic needs, but we in general are looking, our basic needs initiative in the CSU really is focused on wellness as a whole. So we recognize that our students who are students of color, our parenting students, um, you know, our, our students who are quote non-traditional are now outnumbering our our traditional students, our 18 to 24 year old students. So I really, um, this, this becomes a conversation about as we are institutions that are encouraging students um, from all backgrounds to come in, we have to be prepared for them. So I'm gonna, I'll back away from that question for the moment and then hopefully come back to it or maybe it'll be addressed in some of the other things that I'll say. And then I did see this question about living in trailer parks as homelessness. So this definitely depends on um, your region and your location. For in some places, I mean, you know, like I have aunt and uncle who live in a double wide and that I will say that for my very small apartment here in Los Angeles, it's much nicer than what I'm living in here. For other students, we have a number of students who are living in trailers, particularly we see this in our Bay Area. So in San Francisco, you'll see all of these trailer trailers and also in Humboldt. Um, so going from like very urban to very rural where you have trailers that really aren't meant for long-term housing, but are but are serving as, as a home. So this is really dependent upon your region and, and what you're talking about and what you're seeing there. Okay. All right. So I do want to talk about homelessness on a continuum. And this uh, continuum came from research that was done by Ron Hallett and I. Um, in 2017 and what it points out, I know that it looks linear, but I'm just not creative with the graphics because it is not linear. Homelessness, um, as you can see on the far left, um, homelessness and housing instability are both housing insecure. So if I lack a fixed, regular and adequate place to stay, clearly I'm experiencing homelessness. There are also students who are in housing, but they are just um, one step away from homelessness. So if I am in a relationship um, where there is intimate partner violence and I am constantly at risk of, of or being on the edge of, of, of getting kicked out or having to flee, if I am um, just one check away from either having my utilities cut off or getting kicked out or evicted, that's housing unstable. Often students will move, and then we have recently um, housed. So I might have dealt with homelessness or housing instability for um, some time, a short time or a long time, um, but then I become stable. And one of the things, thank you Tiki, one of the things that um, we have noticed is that if I'm experiencing instability, that I carry that with me into my next experience. So we have found that we might place a student in housing and then they, but they continue to feel fear of that instability. That stays with you over time. And then we have students who are housing secure. And if I have never experienced instability or homelessness, then, then you know, a lot of us can, can understand what that's like. But even if I am housing secure, if I've lived with homelessness, it will take me a long time to recover and really ever feel secure and be able to let go of the fear and frustration of having experienced instability. 
Okay, so in terms of prevalence for homelessness in the California system, again, one in 20 of our UC students experienced home, experiences homelessness, one in 10 in our CSU system, and one in five of our California community colleges, which is startling. Okay, let's do poll number four, and that is which of these seem like experiences your students might be facing? So might they be experiencing skipping meals? That should be meals, that's my fault, um, because they lack financial resources. Students living unstable or unsafe living arrangements, both, neither, or I don't know. I'll give you a few seconds to reply. Okay, so we have 58% of folks saying, my students are experiencing both. Um, yeah, it seems very likely. Thank you, thank you for that. Tiki, you can pull that down. All right, so what I wanna point out is that basic needs insecurity is a symptom of larger social problems. We know that economic inequality, and we're seeing that exacerbated by the COVID-19 experiences that we're having, that um, for those folks who are experienced, who are who have low income or no income right now, all of that is feeling worse. The, for here, I don't know if you've heard, but in California, housing costs a lot of money, and so um, the real cost of education often. Um, is not thought about in terms of including housing, but it really is. If I don't have housing, I can't learn. Um, we know that students of color, undocumented students, students who experience foster care, students in our LGBTQI community, um, students who experience disabilities, experience these issues at higher rates. I think it's important for us to ground our understanding of basic needs in understanding inequality overall, and yet we also can't get to the point where we choose not to proceed because we cannot, we haven't yet figured out the ways to intercede in these larger social issues. We have to do both at the same time. We have to acknowledge those that 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 this exists and also move to, um, to support. So I see a question, has family guilt played a role in homelessness? For example, the fear of a student going home due to guilt of not fulfilling family's wishes to attain a degree to feed the family. So it's an interesting and a complex question, and I appreciate that. What I think is important to acknowledge is that there for every student who experiences these issues, there is um, a range of stories. So there's no one narrative that describes all students. Um, what I will say more often than not, in terms of the students that I, the data that I've seen through survey and also the uh, qualitative data that I've, I've gathered is that more often than not, our students are actually um, supporting their parents or supporting family while they're going to school. So more, there, there likely are some some students who um, who who feel like they can't go home. But for a lot of our students, they're are they're they're in close contact with their parents or their families and they're supporting their families along with themselves as they go to college. Um, I see that more often than not. The other question I see, do students who are uh, aging out of the foster care system, so it's interesting, There, there is a correlation between foster experience and homelessness and food insecurity. However, those are not concentric circles that completely overlap. So when I was first um, doing this work, a lot of, I would say I'm, I'm looking at homelessness for students and people say, oh, you mean the foster youth? And I would say, no, actually there's, yes, there are lots of, um, 
current and former foster youth in college who experience homelessness. Um, and there are students who have never um, become in the purview of child protective services and then therefore do not qualify for some of the um, transitional age youth programming for students. So for a long time, students who were experiencing homelessness got sent to your guardian scholars or renaissance scholars or other foster um, programs, but they weren't eligible for any of those services. So I think we 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 do want to make sure that our, our current and, and former foster youth um, are seeing our attention. At the same time, we also want to make sure we understand that, there, that those are not necessarily um, the same group. I'm going to move forward for a bit and then come back for some of these questions. And I'll skip this and talk a bit about the fact that some of this we know and some of it we don't. We know that if I'm experiencing food insecurity, that definitely impacts my ability to process and think. Um, so as soon as I jump off this webinar, I'm going to grab some dinner and that will hopefully make me more coherent. I hope it's not too bad for you now. Um, but we, we do know that having diminished uh, cap capacity, um, is it, it happens in part because I may not have had a place to stay or food to eat. However, one of the things that was interesting that we did see with students who experienced homelessness was that actually um, students who experienced homelessness can have slightly lower GPAs, but generally have very high GPAs. Some of our highest performing students academically are have high GPAs in part because our campuses are the safest places for them to be. So they may come on campus very early, they stay on campus, they go to meetings often because there's food and because it's a place to go and they're interested. They may go to office hours again because they're on campus, they stay in the library they stay well into the night they might be what we call the highly engaged student um, but my question is how long can they maintain that level of engagement given the stress and anxiety because we do know that students who experience homelessness and food insecurity tend to have a high amount of poor health days um, they report incredible impacts on their mental health um, as well um, so that sort of comes back to that question of really looking at basic needs from a holistic perspective and looking at not only um, housing and food, but also mental health, mental and physical health. We also looked at how students use their time. A lot of folks, you know, and I, I know that I am, I'm speaking to the choir here in many regards, but I know often when I speak in the public about these issues, folks, like to suggest that students just need to get financial literacy and get a job. Um, and um, so we asked students, how are they using their time and their money? And what we found is that many students said, I don't have money because there is no money. Um, so um, I cannot budget what I don't have. And so a lot of our students uh, really um, told us overtly sure maybe i could use some support in understanding money and i'll tell you for myself as rashida i could definitely use some support with budgeting and yet that is not why i'm food or housing insecure or that's not why a student is food or housing insecure we also found that students um reported more paid work hours than their peers more f familial obligations at home and more unpaid hours like internship. So what that really says to us is that students who struggle the most are most likely to be working most often. I'm gonna pass this a bit um, and talk very briefly about understanding how our institutions can be trauma-informed in developing programs and services and, and, and strategic responses to addressing basic needs. Um, so really thinking about finding out what's happening, what does exist. I know a lot of us work in institutions where there are a lot of silos. 
Um, so really understanding what everybody is doing. It was really fascinating for me to talk to staff, faculty, and administrators across campuses and find clusters of people doing the work and not necessarily knowing that they were doing the work um, on, on their own campus. Um, evaluating, so doing the research to find out how students are experiencing these issues and how many might. Um, developing the best responses for your institution and then determining how to best sustain those responses. The first thing for me really is thinking about how do we develop um, a team of people who can address these issues and centralizing support for students. So we, found, we have found all different kinds of folks who come together to support in our work in advisory and in practice. Um, our student government for the CSUs is called their associated students. And so I know for our campus, uh, what we call our beach pantry um, is an initiative that was started and continues to be really run through our student government. Our students really saw this as an issue they wanted to address and invested in it. Um, students themselves who are experiencing these issues have to have real actionable roles and decision-making roles in this process. Otherwise, we tend to find creative ideas that won't necessarily work for them. Um, clearly, psychological services, students with disabilities or services to respond to students with disabilities are equity-based programs. Um, having representation from housing has been critical. We've also found some folks who don't necessarily typically come to the room in these kinds of conversations. Having uh, key contacts in financial aid has been crucial. Um, we have so many really strong financial aid administrators um, who both help us support in the kinds of responses we have, including our emergency grants and things like that, but also they can help students better understand their financial aid packages and if there's ways that those financial aid packages can be adjusted to support their needs. Um, in Alaska, I'll say that they have parking enforcement as a part of their advisory committee. Um, they found that st one, students were sleeping in their cars and instead of um, shooing them away or giving them tickets, they found ways to get them better connected to support. And also, we uh, in, at UAA, they were able to find ways to um, keep students from getting Ending, ending up pushed out of institutions because of tickets and things like that. So there's been very many creative responses. So really looking across, I know that um, for our student affairs folks, faculty can be a pain in the neck, um, but we too can offer some support. We can definitely help advocate um, on the academic side. We also can help with research. Um, a lot of our programs and services are really based in social work, and some of our programs are often staffed by social work interns that are from our campus. And so those students get internship hours that are required for their degrees, and they're supporting uh, the needs of our students on campus. Also an important partner has been our auxiliary shops. So um, we are, um, our bookstores, our dining services really have supported in a program called Swipe Out Hunger. So we don't use Swipe Out Hunger, but Swipe Out Hunger does a really great work with helping students who have meal plans donate meals, and then those meals can then be given to students who are food insecure. Uh, one person pointed out those local partners are really crucial. And someone said their school works with the local United Way. And I think that is, a, is, is, is another key partner. Often there are things that we can't do on campus, right? So we may not have housing on campus, but there may be a community agency that can link to housing. Okay. Okay, coming back. A lot of the efforts that have been developed to address basic needs have really been centralized around food security. I think for a lot of us, we know that we can develop a pantry. That seems like something that's doable. 
I've seen pantries as small as a small cabinet and as large as a grocery store, but I think a lot of us are being creative and, ex and expanding our capacities around um, food. Some of us, if we have housing on campus, are able to um, have temporary stays of short uh, stays in our dorms. Um, UCLA, they are their students actually developed an emergency shelter that was that is run by students for students. I'm reading a question over here. It says, are there any community colleges that have offered housing for adults and adult students with kids? I would love to point you to right now, we have Dr. Keith Curry is president at Compton College, and he is um, doing some great work around developing prefab housing. So they are building housing. Um, I know at Cerritos College, they recently um, purchased nearby housing and are going to focus those efforts um, for students as well. And I can list some of these folks for you um, with our NASPA connections here. Okay, so this is an example of the program that we have at Long Beach State. Um, and as you can see, we have a long list of contributors and actually this list is even longer now. Um, and we have a single point of contact in a case management model. And when I say single point of contact, essentially that means a hub of resources or a facilitator of resources. It doesn't mean necessarily one person. And in fact, for us, it definitely doesn't mean one person, although I know uh, Ken Kelly out there is holding down the fort in many ways um, in this current context. But a single point of contact, meaning a single place where a student can come and say, I need help, or apply online and contact and say, I need help, and not have to repeat their story over and over and over again. A lot of our students really don't want to have to um, disclose what, what's happening um, at all. Um, and when they do, they don't want to have to say it more than once. And so having one place where they can tell their story once and then get connected to resources in, is incredibly important. One question, how have you been navigating signing students up for CalFresh who went home due to COVID-19? And actually, I wonder if Ken's still out there. Ken, are you still there? I am. <laughs> I don't know the answer to this question. And so the two questions, one is how's CalFresh working for you and how are you, I know we, I will come back to the other question. So how is CalFresh working? Well, right now we're doing Zoom appointments with students on an appointment basis. So our students can sign up for appointments uh, with our two people that run our, our CalFresh program. We're about to go into a new era of um, doing it all on, on Google and Google, the, the complement of Google to speed up and also help us to, to make the process a lot clearer and a lot faster for our students. But for, in the meantime, right now, we're doing Zoom appointments for our students and navigating it that way. Yeah, I think we're all learning as we're going here. Thank you, Ken. Um, I see your questions and I'm gonna try to get as many of them as I can as possible. Um, as I mentioned, we have our beach, beach pantry. We also have an app called Beach Bites. So we all have meetings with, with food. And so um, the, in the app, um, an administrator can point out we have food and this is again, pre-COVID, but we have food and in the union on the second floor, you can come and get it and students will get a push notification that it's available. They can come gather that food and go. We, as someone mentioned, have, um, so SNAP in, the, in, in most of the rest of the country, we call it CalFresh because we have to cow everything here in California. Um, so we support the application process for students to get access to SNAP. Um, we do have emergency housing. Someone asked how long. So with our emergency housing program, um, we can house students for about 10 days. 
Um, however, we recently were funded for, as I mentioned earlier, a rapid rehousing program. So rapid rehousing essentially is moving students as quickly as possible into housing. And so again, we're working with Hovenus. What Hovenus is doing is subsidizing rent and having a case management model with students. And so getting them into housing, um, supporting their rent and potentially their utilities and then slowly the student, as they're able, start to um, pay their own rent um, over time. That is the shortest version of rapid rehousing I can tell you about, but I'm happy if you wanna reach out to me in the future, I'm happy to discuss this program or send you materials. Also, there's some online resources with our John Burton uh, Advocates for Youth um, has been pushing, um, has been really supporting and driving this rapid rehousing movement here in California. So there's a lot of information from JBay that they can provide. We also have emergency grants, and it's important that we um, point out emergency grants versus emergency loans, because of, of, often our institutions were prepared to do emergency loans, but those loans in some ways become like payday loans because the students have to repay them so quickly, they become more of a burden than a support. So our emergency grants are usually about $500 and our students apply through online application. Um, some of our students feel like at the beginning of the semester, they may have not taken out loans or very few loans. And so they don't recognize or know that they can navigate a bit um, and, and reactivate some of those loans. So we do um, have them meet with a financial aid advisor. So those are some examples of some of the things that we do with our students. But really, our students come in and are met with a meet with a case manager who helps really find the best match of services for them. Okay, so I think this is our last poll, and I'm moving really quickly because I do want to address some of our questions related to COVID-19. Um, and so let's do this last poll. So what is the next step for your institution in addressing basic needs? Um, and I, you know, we, I only had five options. So here are just a few. Um, is it to conduct a study? Is it to form a committee? Is it to sustain, uh, seek sustainable resources or expand current offerings or something else? Unfortunately, I couldn't do it all. So which which feels most appropriate for you? So for 21% of us, we are ready to do the research. And if that's you and you want some support, definitely you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, also in Philadelphia, the Hope Center also is helping connect folks to the right fit for researchers. I'm happy to support you or help you in identifying your next steps around research. So um, there is a community of folks who are doing this work. Lots of us are thinking about forming a committee of diverse stakeholders, which is really exciting opportunity to really build our village to address basic needs. Um, see, so I find some of our institutions have been fearful about talking about this openly and honestly in our communities and in the press. But I find that when institutions get ahead of that and say, this is something we see as important, communities respond. So really connecting through public knowledge um, and informing our community that we are addressing this sometimes helps. And for some of us, you know, we're already doing the work and looking for creative ways to expand. Thanks, Tiki. Okay. So I've been talking sort of in a vacuum because we know that everything has changed in these last several weeks and longer for some of us. Um, and some of us, we're, we're just getting there, but um, we're all in this place together. And I think I was in a webinar that was run by Sarah Goldick-Robb with Hope Center. 
And she started um, the conversation by saying, sometimes as we're working with students, they come to us in a variety of ways. Um, a lot of our students sometimes come with great grace and humility, and sometimes they're upset and scared just like we are. And so I think as we think about these issues, it's important to maybe center around thinking about one student in your mind and holding that student in your mind to think about how um, how I want to respond to students in these crises. And I think centering in that can be incredibly helpful. Um, so in that way, really communicating to students what is available to them can be incredibly helpful. Um, if there is on-campus housing available, I strongly encourage you to house students who have no place to go. And if they're telling you they have no place to go, then believe them. I think sometimes we're very fearful of um, the limited resources that we have, and that's and that's true. It's it is true. We have limited resources, but if we can um, house the students who say that they're experiencing homelessness, and they may not use that term, but if they say they have no place to go, it's important to believe them um, and do our best to take care of yourself and be safe um, as best as you can. Um, I'm posting lots of resources, and they're they're going to be here um, in this uh, presentation. Um, and also, I can, you know, I'm going to send out a list of resources. Some of those resources are very local specific, but some of them are also national. Um, we just got news from Betty DeVos that student loans are payments are going to there's there's mm, I'm scared to say definitively what it's going to be, but as of right now, I'm hearing that there may be some delays in requiring students to repay loans this year. It'll be interesting to really take a look and make sure that there's follow through on that from our, our federal government. Um, connecting to local food banks. So if you have a food bank, if you're able, I know for us, our, our Beach Pantry was located in our union, um, and the union is not available to us right now. So our Beach Pantry is doing pop-ups when they have food available. And so getting the word out to students who we've been working with in the past has been really important and making sure they have access to that food. If you don't have a pantry um, but can help students um, get connected to local food pantries that are still working. That's really important. Our federal government is doing some interesting stuff around SNAP and access to SNAP given, um, given COVID-19. Um, again, right now we know that our federal government sometimes is giving us some mixed messages, um, but as best as we can stay connected to our, our local county officials, um, the more we'll have um, clear information on how to step forward each day. Um, let's see. If, if you have students are, who are highly mobile, you may want to see if they want to try U-Haul for a while. And I don't know, it depends on availability, but they had 30 days of free storage. So if students are moving around and have no place to put their things, you might want to offer them that assistance. We also know that some folks who wouldn't be in the environment that they're in now, if not for the COVID-19 closures. So if students are not safe, we definitely want to connect them to the National Domestic Violence Hotline or local resources. Again, locally, it depends from place to place um, and things are actively changing and we know it, but um, it's important to try to see if you're having um, changes in the ability to evict. I know here in Los Angeles um, right now, our county officials are talking about halting evictions for now. Um, I know that this is, you know, I'm not, yeah, I'm giving you what I have and things change from day to day. So down here, this is a lot of information. So things to think about in terms of um, things like WIC and general assistance, 
and unemployment. I know that lots of us are trying to apply for unemployment and that is a struggle. I will provide a PDF of my list of resources and I can do that, you know, just after this and then slowly we'll hear more. Uh, you'll get more information about this presentation. I want us to hear from the students really, just really briefly. Um, and these are some of the things that they have said to me. Despite of all, I'm still happy and I'm grateful to being able to pursue an education. I know a lot of people can't or haven't been able to. As hard as it is, just the fact that I can eat, I can still come to college or get some kind of degree. That's still a win-win for me. That's how my life has been. I'm very dedicated. I'm very push, push, push. Was I tired all the time? Heck yeah, I'm still pushing. I strongly believe that education is the greatest investment that the society can put upon itself. An investment in us, which is the future, which is the next generation, is the most rewarding for an economy, for research, for science, for literature, for culture, the arts, and for any budget cuts to be coming towards us will dramatically affect us. They affect our health, they affect our future, they affect our progression out of poverty. So these are some resources um, in collaboration with Dr. Hallett and McGuire. Um, we've written a couple of pieces on addressing homelessness. The purple book is more the academic -y boring one. The one on the left um, is really straightforward, I think, and gives some ideas. It's about homelessness, but also discusses um, supports around food security as well. So I wanna back up a bit and look at some of your questions. One of the questions that I saw um, is for me, but also for others, and I encourage folks maybe to give some resources in the chat function, and hopefully that won't mess things up, Tiki. But the question was, we've had to suspend our food recovery app meal uh, program because of the physical distancing. Does anyone have creative ideas about how to um, practice physical distancing and support our students around um, food security. So I'm wondering if there are creative ideas out there that anyone would like to share. While people are sharing, Rashida, there was a request that you please go back to the graphic of housing insecure recently housed. Um, uh there was a graphic you, somebody yeah. wanted to see. This one, I think. Thank you. Did we get any feedback on that question? Uh, we, I'm pasting one now about virtua, virtual activity ideas for students during COVID-19 to keep their social distancing. Great. Thank you. I know we have just a few minutes and there's loads of questions. So I do encourage folks if I, there, there's a number of resources that'll be coming at you, but you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, some of the questions are related to our program. Um, our ASI, our student government, um, provided initial funding for our beach pantry. In what ways, what's the role of our student government as of right now, Ken? So I'm reaching out to Ken. Um, He's probably helping students right as I speak, but are there other roles in which our student government has been supportive of your work? Absolutely. Um, actually, our students are looking to put something into all the syllabuses. They were gonna have a, a referendum uh, through their government to see if they could get uh, a referendum that they would bring to the Academic Senate uh, on campus to provide uh, our information about our program. So I think that would be wonderful if that happens. In addition to all the other things, uh, during this, this circumstance we're in right now, uh, we're all kind of 
pooling our resources to make things happen. We're going to have a uh, pop in, pop in, be rab and go pantry on Friday, and uh, we're all kind of contributing uh, whatever resources we have, money and other things to make that happen. So it's all kind of a collaborative effort, and I've always looked at it as a seamless effort that we we make the make this happen. So students should never see that's ASI, that's basic needs. It's all one. Thanks, Ken. I'd also say that our students really are driving our meal responses because our students um, through our Feed a Need program do donate meals to our students um, for our emergency students. I know we have just two minutes. I also, someone asked about the challenges with enrolling our students um, in SNAP. Jessica Bartholo with the Western Center on the Center, Western Center on Law and Poverty is doing some great work, particularly now, um, given COVID-19 and the struggles for, for people in general and students specifically related to really um, changing the rules around SNAP. So definitely follow um, that work. As, as things are changing dramatically. Um, yes, it's absolutely fine to share my contact information. People are welcome to reach out to me. Um, I know that on the East Coast, it's pretty late and I'm really appreciative of all of you for your incredible efforts. Even when we're not dealing with a pandemic, your efforts are laudable. Um, and difficult because sometimes they're really recognized by the institution and sometimes they're not. So I'm incredibly grateful to each and every one of you for the work that you're doing. And, even, and now, um, given everything that's going on, please take care of yourselves. Be safe, breathe, stretch, um, <laughs> watch a cat video, do what you need to do because you get to take care of yourself in this time too. And I thank you for giving me your time and being so generous. Rashida, we want to thank you, everyone. Uh, by early next week, we will be able to share Rashida's uh, PDF to PowerPoint and resources along with the recording uh, from this, our time together today. We'd like to thank you for joining us. Ken, any last words? Uh, just be safe. And uh, it's just, uh, it's a little overwhelming right now how many students are coming in and we're just you know, thankful that we have some resources to provide our students. Well, whether you're on the East Coast or the West Coast, take care all. And remember, we'll be reaching out soon. Have a wonderful afternoon or evening.